Welcome to Madison Church Online. I'm Stephen Feith, lead pastor. We're so glad that you're joining us. Today is a different Sunday gathering than what we're used to having, whereas I typically give a talk. Today I've invited teaching pastor Sarah Hansen and Jason Webb to join us as we answer your questions about the Bible. The past few weeks we've been in a series called Mature Audiences Only, in which we've been going, taking a deep dive into the questions that we have about the Bible. We certainly couldn't get around to all of them. And so for this last Sunday, we kind of brainstormed and dreamt up a scenario in which we just rapid-fired answers to your questions. And so if you're watching or listening online, one, we want to join you, we invite you to join us in person soon. But if you have questions about the Bible that we're not able to get to today, please send us an email at the bottom of our website, madisonchurch.com, and we will try to answer those questions. So this very first question we got is for all three of us, and it is, what are the daily practices or routines that you, panel members, follow to engage with the Bible in your personal life. Sarah, you want to go first? Thank you. I would love to start off the day. (laughs) All right. Well, I think um, the pastor answer is to say every morning I wake up at 4 a.m. and I open my Bible and I read it for an hour and a half, and that's how I start my day. Um, But I don't really like to lie, so that's not what I do. I am not a morning person. I don't like to engage with my Bible first thing in the morning. Um, I don't like to engage with anything besides coffee. So there's that. But um, in, throughout my day, I guess I find myself, it's not the same every single day. Some days I will sit down and I will read for an hour, hour and a half. And sometimes I get stuck on these tangents and I you know, go all these side trails and I want to know what are they talking about. And I want to look it up online and, and find out what that meant in Greek because I don't know how to speak or read Hebrew or Greek or any of those things. And um, so sometimes there's that. Sometimes um, it's listening to a podcast of somebody reading through the Gospels or something in my car. Sometimes it comes through a conversation with other people. Um, You know, a, a, a what if or how do you one of these questions even from just somebody in my life. And then, you know, well, let's go look it up in the Bible. It can be my paper Bible. It can be, like I said, a podcast. It can be um, on my phone. I'll I'll use them all. Yeah. And Jason? Uh, Well, I get up at 4 a.m. every morning and and read the Bible for an hour and a half. Of course you do. Is that that the answer? (laughs) Yeah, that was the answer. No, uh, I actually do. I've become more of a morning person, not by choice, but because I have six children. And uh, so I do get up early uh, in the morning and and find that that, for me, is the best time to engage uh, the Word of God. Um, I've changed over the years how I engage it, though. Uh, earlier in my life, I would have really gone heavy into studying and dissecting. I had, uh, you know, study Bibles that were helpful, giving me information about the context. I had one that was the archaeological study Bible that I loved because it gave me a lot of the understanding of the ancient Near Eastern times. Um, but for me right now, that's not very helpful. And it's not that it's not helpful. It may be the perfect thing for uh, some of you to do. For me, I need to take a very different approach right now in my life uh, to scripture reading, uh, and that's more of a personal, mysterious, meditative uh, re- approach to it. So I, I kind of have a routine, and that's there's a lot of reason to it. But I have a routine in the morning um, where I begin with writing down some prayers, and for the last five years, I've just gone through the Psalms. It's the only book I've been in. Uh, and every day I would just read a psalm and just write down, I, I actually just write it word for word in my journal, and then I just journal as to what God's saying to me in that and write it kind of as a prayer to God. Uh, this year I decided that five years in the psalms, maybe I should move on to something else, uh, but I've, I've taken on a, a very, very, very simple approach that anybody can uh, uh, anybody can model in that I have you version Bible app. Uh, shout out to the guys who and, and ladies who made that. But there's just a verse of the day that comes in every day. And right now, I'm just copying that down in my journal, did it this morning, and reflecting on that, uh, allowing God's Spirit to speak to me in whatever way uh, the Spirit wants to speak to me. Yeah. So I do the deep dive, obviously, for those of you who, who know me. I wrote a book on Jude, which takes two minutes to read, but it took me three years to write a book on. And well, um, plug in the first question. They're available yeah. for sale after the service. They're on Amazon. 
They're never getting invited. Five star reviews. The same Sunday again. You too can uh, read <laughs> Uprising. Fourteen ninety nine. Um, <laughs> it is actually a great book. Don't get well, us wrong. <laughs> um, where was I going with that? So I read the Bible too, and uh, not just the books I write. And but this is I, I imagine since I I pastor this church, you all of you know me fairly well. Um, we've gotten together, but like I, I tend to I hang out in the Gospels first and foremost. So I'm reading the teachings of Jesus. And usually it's something that Jesus said that as I'm reading it again for the hundred millionth time, that if there's something that pops up to me. So a few weeks ago, this idea that like there's a new command I give you and that word new, you know, gets up. I'm like, oh, wait, that, why does that jump out at me? And then it goes from a spiral. It goes to the deep dive, like what you're talking about, where it's like it's the obsession of just um, figuring out everything that I can. And so um, and then also pastoring here, like uh, I'm planning teaching series out. It's, it's about 15 months out. So it's at least a year pretty planned out. So there's future kind of gentle readings that I'm doing, just lightly leaning into. And then um, as we get closer to me actually having to teach it, there's a, there's a much deeper dive. Um, I'll be honest, I do not read every day though. So I have a day off on Friday. That's very like religious to me is to not work on Friday. And I just don't get around to it. And uh, maybe you can silently judge me, and that's okay if that's you. But um, if you do read it all seven days. But for me, it's, it's not an everyday practice. What is the recommended starting point for someone who is new to the Bible? They're new to it. They don't know where to start. Where, should the, where would you recommend as their pastor start? Let's start with Jason this time. I, I think the general answer I would give people is start with Jesus. So Because that's really the, the trajectory of Scripture is to focus uh, towards Jesus, to point towards Jesus. So any... Just pick up one of the stories about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, I usually recommend Luke because I like Luke. Uh, but I also think it's important to understand where people are at when they come to Scripture. So if somebody's really struggling in life, I'm not necessarily going to point them to one of the Gospels or accounts of Jesus' story. I'm going to say, just do what I've been doing. Read a psalm. You don't have to think about it. Just read it because the the reality of life is in those. So that's that's what I would recommend. Yeah. Well, I know that Stephen's going to tell everybody to start in the book of Jude, so I'm going to stick with the Gospels as well. I think that's usually um, where I would recommend for somebody to start. However, I kind of want to know the person a little bit to decide which Gospel I'm going to recommend, because each one was written by a different person to different people for a different purpose, right? And, and you know, so if you are um, strict, like, just give it to me straight and short as possible, read Mark. If you want all the drama, read Luke. If you are all about, um, you want to hear how much Jesus loves you and God loves you and how much God loves his favorite me, but John, um, <laughs> then Naturally. start in John. You know, I mean, if you have a really um, concrete understanding of the Old Testament, you're going to want to start with Matthew because it just makes sense for those contexts. So um, I guess I think it's a little bit more individualized, but um, I personally like Mark. So I send people there if I don't know them at all. Yeah. So we got, we got Luke, potentially. We have Mark. I'm going to say John. I think John requires the least amount of work. To, to translate into our day and age. I think you can read it. It's a very straightforward reading. Theo theologically, it, it can be very deep, but it reads also very easily. And so I, I usually tell people, yeah, to go with, with John or buy my book, Jude. And the, all the Jude references are getting cut out of the video and podcast. This is just for you in the room now. Uh, question three, this one I get to answer. It's how do we ensure that our interpretation of Scripture remains faithful to its original context without imposing our contemporary perspectives. And so this is a great question. Uh, I think, Jason, you and I were talking this week that one of the things that we both don't like is how popular the inductive Bible studies are. Is it inductive or deductive? Inductive, inductive Bible studies. And it's where you get together, we're going to read a chapter of John, and then it's like, what do you think this means? What do you think this means? What do you think this means? And those are very popular Bible studies, and I don't get it. Um, because as we're, this reoccurring theme that's coming on is like, 
Well, John had a purpose, and it's not a mystery. We have so many good scholars and theologians and archaeologists who can tell you precisely what John meant in that original context. And so I think for all of us today, as we're learning, like, how do we do this? I think you got to get, like, some sort of a study Bible. They, um, they come out with, like, different what we would use are commentaries. And so those are, like, an entire book on one book in the Bible. That might be too deep for you at this point, but a study Bible would be an absolutely great place to begin if you're kind of like, okay, I'm reading. I don't understand what's going on. We start there. As always, when we begin studying the Bible, the very first question you need to ask is, what did this mean to them? What did this mean to them? You can't just read it in our day and age. And so when I do my own personal deep dives with Jesus, I like to pretend I'm like the 13th disciple. I'm there and I'm hearing all of this. And that's why like a lot of times when I'm speaking and teaching on the gospels, like these jokes that I tell that sometimes you think are funny, most of them, you don't know I'm joking. And so I just move on really fast. But like, I'm like, I I feel like I'm the funny disciple. Like I'm sitting there and I'm seeing all of the humor of the, of the situation. And, and so I try to bring that, but once you understand it in their context, we got to decide then I think like, what is the gap between their day and age and ours? Because some of the questions we're going to get to in a moment is the gap between us and Leviticus is huge. It's deep and it's wide. And so the conversation with how does like Leviticus apply to us today, huge, 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 huge. John, as I already mentioned, it's narrower. It's not as deep. It's a little bit easier. And so I think that when we're talking about reading the Bible, understanding what it meant to them, figuring out what the differences are, and then we can begin to put some applications uh, in our own life. But a, a bonus kind of point to this is I think community is key in the process. I think community is absolutely key. Being in an environment like this where the things that you think or the things that you understand are challenged rightfully and in a healthy context with dialogue and conversation, we begin to get in trouble when we're studying the Bible by ourselves, all alone, unchallenged, not considering what other people think and their ideas as well, not just other believers. I would say that's critical, but people who don't share our faith and and to take all of that in as we're kind of um, messing around with that. And so those would be what I would say. Is there anything? I I would just add that you're never going to be able to divorce your contemporary perspective from your reading. Uh, It's just impossible. That's why what Stephen uh, said is very vital studying in community uh, because that's where people will be able to share, say, hey, you might be have a blind spot here or that just may not be applicable to here. Um, so I just affirm what you would say on that. Anything to add? Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it, again, important to stay in community because you shouldn't have a new idea. The Bible has been, was written obviously a really long time ago and there shouldn't be like, oh, I saw, have this new revelation that nobody else has ever had. It, that's that weird. That, yeah. It's that's a cult. Weird. Yeah. Exactly. You don't <laughs> want to start a cult. If you do, let's talk. Um, this next question goes to Jason. Um, and the question was asked by somebody, and, and it wasn't in the form of a question. You and I talked about this, but we, we tried to turn it into a question, which is how can I shift my perspective to relate more personally to the narratives in the Bible coming from a background where the Bible was held in extremely high reference and just a little more context. It was almost like Father, the, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Bible, where the Bible is almost idol-like. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's a very, very dangerous uh, tradition in a lot of churches to uh, really uphold the Bible. Everything is about the Bible instead of about God. Um, and and N.T. Wright talks about this. He, he's, he said the problem with the what we call the Word is that we miss who the real Word is. The real Word, Scripture says, Scripture itself says is Jesus. The, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so everything is about God. Everything is pointing to Jesus, the Spirit, uh, God the Father. So when we began to and, and some of you may come from traditions like this where everything will show me in the Bible, will show me in the Bible, will show me in the Bible. Well, that's not what the intent of Scripture is. And so we, we run the ris- risk of idolatry uh, when it comes to Scripture itself. The other thing that happens is that we then limit God uh, when we elevate Scripture. Like the only way God speaks is through Scripture. Well, now we're limiting God. We're saying, well, God can't speak through nature. God can't speak... Uh, prophetically through people. God can't speak through art and music. Uh, I, I mean, I, I remember 
sitting at a Andrea Bocelli uh, concert not too long ago. Many, many of you may know him, many of you may not. A uh, great singer, uh, many of you may not care. But I was there um, at, at an arena, and I didn't understand the words. It was an Italian. I didn't understand really the meanings of the song, but the voice and the music lifted me to a plane of, like, this is God. Not that he's speaking about God, not that he's singing about God, but there is a beauty here that can't come from a human being. And, and, and so God does speak in these ways. So we don't want to limit that. The other thing that happens when people begin to just say, well, show me in the Bible, is that they make the Bible something it's not. You may have heard it this way, that the Bible is God's answer book to every question in life. That is the biggest lie I have ever heard, and it has done so much damage to people over the years. I have so many questions about this week alone that scripture does not answer. Now, it may, be, may point me in a certain direction towards a step I should take, but it does not answer. What the Bible is, is a beautiful, messy, chaotic, at times, collection of poems, letters, stories, perspectives, of a story of God and his people. And it's a story you're invited into. And there are times where a, a, a writer may exaggerate to prove a point. There are times where he, he may say something that makes you go, hmm, that's strange, but it's, it's pointing you to something bigger. And so when scripture says, all, when Timothy and Paul, uh, I mean, Paul says in Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed, that's not saying this means that this is an inerrant word of God. That's not the point. The point is these writers and their experiences have come together and something collectively bigger is happening as you read it. It's the story that, that even if you don't understand everything that happens in it or what is exactly saying, it's inviting your life into something bigger. And you can even just kind of close your eyes and say, yes. That's what it is. And so actually, I think people who ask this question, who think that they have a high view of God that is kind of like a proof textbook, have a very low view of Scripture. Those who idolize the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And those who are trying to unlearn right. that are exactly. sensing there's something more. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would be a practical step? Somebody coming from that background. Well, I mean, like, and you came from that background. Yeah, I came right? from that background. I would say this is where it's kind of the opposite of what we just said. Yeah. Um, take out your um, your highlighters and your cross references, and stop. Just stop doing that for a little while. You can come back to that later, but but just start to read it from a, almost a mysterious human perspective. Of okay, what's Luke going through as he's writing this? Yeah, absolutely, no, that's yeah. good. Um, going to this next question with Sarah, um, how can we? And this is a popular one. We. I intended to answer it in the series, and I didn't get around to it. Um, how can we reconcile or approach um, what we call in uh, theological circles perceived inconsistencies? Normal people say contradictions within the Bible. <laughs> how do we approach those? Well, that is a good question. Um, I think there's there's kind of a couple different ways to look at it. I think there's um, first of all what. Where are you seeing the inconsistencies? You know, um, is it between something that happened in the Old Testament and something that happened in the New Testament? Because that's very, those are very different um, places and times and people that are that are being written to and about. Um, but also, I think sometimes it, it's important to remember that the Bible is not one book, right? It is 66 books written by a whole bunch of authors and throughout a great span of time. And some of those, um, th that was on purpose, right? We believe that God inspired them to write what they wrote, but it, we don't necessarily understand what that meant, what it looks like, what it felt like, right? So what we can see, even in the example of the Gospels, is four different um, tellings of the same several years, but it's told through their voice. And that's why I said I would 
I would want to know the person that I'm recommending what they would what they should start reading first, right? Because you want to take a perspective that you're going to understand. But just because something is found in one book and not found in another doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that that person didn't have that in their in their the front of their mind. That wasn't the highlight for them. Similar to when we leave here today, um, somebody on this side of the room is going to have a different remembrance than somebody over here about something that was said. And um, somebody is going to think that Stephen wrote a book on the book of James instead of Jude because that just happens, yeah. right? But that doesn't mean that it was a lie. It just, it just right. means there were misunderstandings or personal um, personal things that got in there. And I don't, I'm not going to pretend to understand how and why God allowed some uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to write similar but yet slightly different things. I have no idea, but God is okay with it, so I guess I am too. Um, so there's that. And then also inconsistencies, I think um, it can feel inconsistent if we're, if we're trying to look at it again through our lens, through our cultural time and place, in our perspective. Yeah, and I think of too, like when it, with the gospel is something that, comes to mind. We've got four different Gospels all telling the same story. Like uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, Lindsay had posted something that I think like half a dozen people at Madison Church shared. Who wrote it? There's one person who wrote it and six people shared it. That's not six different stories. That's one. What you get with the Gospels are is if four of us leave today or six of us leave today and we all go on Facebook and we all write our own thing about what happened, that's the story of the Gospel. We were all there, but then you have your own way, your own vocabulary, your own history, your own reason for writing. Parts that you're going to be like, this was really important to me, so I'm going to write about that question. And you've probably already forgot about the third question we asked. Some of you did because it wasn't important to you. And you were spacing out. And, you know, like, and that's fine. But that's my the point is, too, when we're talking about corroboration, like if all of us witnessed a crime, if we all came in with the same story, that would be very suspect. Like, they would be like, the people who witnessed this obviously got together and talked about it. They're using the same words, and that's not human. And so it actually plays into the strength of the Gospels in terms of historical reliability that they're different. When Jason, Sarah, and I leave today, if we're going to talk about today, Jason, you're probably going to talk about Stephen because maybe you've talked about me before with some of your friends, and maybe I've met them, but you'll say, and this other pastor from Green Bay, Sarah, you leave, you might mention me to your friends and a pastor from, from Chicago. I, if I was talking to you, will use their names because you know them. And that's some kind of one of the contradictions, supposedly, is at the end of the Gospels when we have different tellings of who found the empty tomb. Because one uses Mary, one uses the women, and one uses this. Well, they were all there. But all three of the writers who use different accounts were writing to different audiences who, one, they might not have known Mary. So who cares? Why would you use her name? So there were some women that found them. But somebody who knows Mary says, ha-ha, this is going to be important. And so I definitely think that when it comes to that, and as you mentioned, those 66 books in the Bible, like you cannot compare Leviticus to Acts. I mean, they're just, it, it's not comparable. You also get the next question. You kind of leaned into it. You've already leaned into it a little bit. Considering the New Testament's view, the statement that Scripture is God-breathed, how should we interpret and apply the Old Testament laws in contemporary Christian practice? I actually re-listened to the uh, teaching he did a couple weeks ago. Um, were most of you here for that? And I agreed. I agreed. Well, I, I take my I take my disclaimer back. Then. Yeah, so I'm obviously can... <laughs> right. <laughs> I agreed. I I do believe that it is very important to remember that the Old Testament was written a very long time ago to a certain people, from a certain viewpoint, for a specific purpose. Also, Jesus came to fulfill, right? Not abolish those Old Testament laws, or uh, is that how it's written? Histories History and all of that, yeah. And, yeah. So, you know, when, I mean, this isn't exactly a great example, but when when I place an order with Amazon, once it's fulfilled, it doesn't mean I never place that order, right? So it's not like that didn't ever exist. It's not like we don't need that for reference for something. We do need to understand what was happening before, why it was important for Jesus to come. We know that the whole Old Testament points towards our need for Jesus. All of those 600, how many was there? 612 rules? 13. 13. You, you poor people had to post up and sit and watch. So... 
all of those rules were, were there for a purpose for those people at that time. But also it brought to the to very clear that nobody can do that. Everybody will fall short. Everybody. There is not one of us that can maintain all of those rules and laws and things that they thought were, ab well, the things that God said at that time were absolutely necessary. And they had to atone for those. They had to, oh no, now I screwed up. Now I have to do this and all these things. And Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus made a way for us to be forgiven without having to do all of those things. Jesus made a way for us to have a new covenant. That Old Testament is an old covenant. Yeah. That's what was. Now we have a new covenant under Jesus, a new covenant. And sometimes I think people erroneously think that the new covenant is easier. Just love God, love others. No big deal. I think Stephen said that, right? You said? <laughs> a new command I give you. He said it was no big deal, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it sounds easier, but it's actually harder, yeah. right? It is harder. You can't, you, the old, let's say the Ten Commandments, right? We weren't supposed to murder people. If I'm loving somebody, I can't murder them. I just can't. Even though sometimes we might want to, then we're not loving that person, right? That, that's not okay. It, it, loving our, our God and loving each other is really hard, and I can't do it. I can't do it alone. I can't do it without the Holy Spirit. I can't do it without my Jesus. And I fail. And every time I fail, I need Jesus to step in and cover me for that. So it's not, I don't want to say the Old Testament is washed away, no good. It always points to Jesus. And the more I read the Old Testament, the more it makes me understand why Jesus had to come and why he had to have uh, fulfill certain things in certain ways and what that actually means. It brings a deeper understanding to me in my walk with Jesus. Um, but if you do want to go and try to live out those 613 laws, I mean, by all means, go for it. But Good luck. Yeah, and it's Good not, and it's not Christianity. It, it is not right. Christianity. No, it's a and religion that Jesus would not today. have come and died right. if all we had to do was follow a, a bunch of rules. He wouldn't have done it. Why would he do that? Why would he put himself through that? But he did. Yeah, and I think too, like we're okay. And what we've stated over and over again is that like we're all okay with this idea. Like we want to understand the original context and like what was going on. We're all okay with that for the most part. Nobody has shaken their head. No, like no, it just matters what I think of it today. We're okay with that, but then when it comes to application, we're not okay with having different criteria for application. We're okay, we're okay having different criteria for reading it, but then when I say something like, well, we apply Leviticus differently to our lives than John, all of a sudden we go back to this kind of, nope, we read it all the same way, mindset, except when it comes to the application, right? That's what we do. No, it should all be equally applicable. Well, that's not true. As a matter of fact, when we're talking about one of those words that popped out to me, I read a passage last week with you all, and I had a moment. I had to keep going by it, but Paul says, I told you what was most important. Now, hold on a second. So now we have the Apostle Paul in a New Testament letter that he writes, acknowledging that there's parts of the message that are more important than other parts of the message. That's not today's sermon. That'll come out in a future book. Um, Jason, with, with limited time, how can we reconcile the depictions of violence attributed to God in the Old Testament with the New Testament's emphasis on love and peace? Limited time. Limited time. Okay. Now, I, I, it, I, I think, first of all, you should be bothered by the, the violence in the Old Testament. I mean, if you're not, then there's you probably should see a therapist because that's like serious violence. I mean, there's, there's story after story of, and then they went in and wiped out all the men, women, and children and took all their donkeys and stole all their gold. And you, you read it, you're like, what in the world is going on? Well, I, I think you got to understand, again, it goes back to context. You got to understand the day and age in which this was written. Everything was about tribes. Your tribe, and actually things haven't changed a whole lot, your tribe was your identity. We call our tribes different now, but they had their tribe. And every tribe had a god or gods. And everything was about tribal survival, tribal welfare. It's about pursuing the good of your tribe. And so you understood that not only do I have my tribe, but every other tribe is trying to take me out. 
And so you have these depictions in Scripture of, uh, of war and violence and all that where tribes come in and they wipe out in a war or a battle another tribe and they don't leave anybody alive. Why? Because they thought for their survival, if we, we leave one person alive, then we run the risk of being taken out ourselves. We have to take everything of theirs. So you read that. That's the context. And you should be bothered by it. It's brutal. It's violent. It's barbaric. But it was the day and age. Kill or be killed. So writers are writing that. That's their reality. They're writing that. They'll say things like, and then they killed the women and the children and took everything. And then, this is the mind-blowing part, God introduces something in the midst of that, side by side with that, something revolutionary. He says to Abraham, you will be the tribe of all nations to bless other tribes. So side by side with this brutality and this violence is God introducing a totally different way of thinking and living, of saying, okay, now you, in the midst of the way culture currently interacts, you start caring for the poor. You start caring for the alien, the refugee, the immigrant. You, you, you know, I know you've taken all this land. Leave a little bit for the people who don't have some. Just leave a corner of your lot for them. And this is the trajectory of Scripture. Even as you go to the New Testament, people wonder, why, why do you mention slavery in the Scripture? It's not because God endorses slavery. My goodness, no. Paul talks to slaves. Yeah. He talks to them. They were not considered worth talking to in that day and age. And he gives them instructions as if they're human beings. He's not saying slavery is okay. He's introducing, and this is the trajectory of God, he's introducing a whole different way of elevating the marginalized and the oppressed. That is the, the trajectory of Scripture. I'll get more passionate, but I probably should stop. But that's that's how I'd answer that question. Absolutely. And then even that whole thing, of you'll be a tribe that blesses other tribes. That's very, I mean, that's, that's Jesus, right? I mean, that, 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 those are the teachings of Jesus. So I think when we're reading in the Old Testament and we see something like that from God, it, we're trying to like balance. And, and, I, and I would say that trajectory continues. I mean, scriptures, the canon is closed, but scripture and the story of scripture continues. So we are to, to always be introducing that that trajectory of God to the marginalized and the oppressed. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. So this last question is, what is the history and process behind the compilation of the biblical canon? And uh, you could Google this. You can ask ChatGP it, and uh, it'll tell you. But I want to say a few things that I don't think you're going to find. One, it was a very human process, and that makes you very uncomfortable. We want to imagine Jesus coming down from heaven with the gift box of that first Bible, all completed chapters, verses, and everything, and said, this is it, and here's where you can order more. You know, like they got to, you know, and, and that's not it. And when we're talking about four different gospel writers and we're talking about God using inspiration and reality, we're talking about God working with people. And so why would we expect God to not work with people in putting it together? As a matter of fact, I'll go as far as to say, if we came out and there was one person who said, God told me these are the 66 books of the Bible, I would say that's suspect or sus as the kids say. That's suspect. Why? Because God doesn't work like that. God works through multitudes of people over multiple times of years. I mean, the New Testament wasn't written in one year. It was written over the course of a century. Our Bible as we have it today, the Old Testament, we're talking hundreds of years, different authors. So, of course, when we get to the canon and you're like, so a bunch of people just got together and decided which 66 books of the Bible were in there? God collaborated with human beings to write the books that we have. And then God collaborated with human beings to put it together. That's just the way that God has always worked. Now, how did they decide these New Testament books? Okay, they had libraries and a lot fewer than what we have today. You, I mean, libraries were like a major focal point in a city. So you might have had 10 or 12 like known libraries in that time. And within those libraries, they were already collecting the Bibles. And we can historically show you that at the end of the first and second centuries, almost all of these libraries had the same books of the Bible. What they might have not had is like one might not have had Second Peter, 
and one might not have had Third John, but one might have had Third John and Second Peter, but not had you know First Peter. So they get together, and these guys they say, "Okay, look, the world is expanding. People, our churches are growing, and they do what you and I do. We want people to find and follow Jesus." And so they get together and they say, we need to make this more accessible. How do we know which ones we, we are counting here? And they came up with the canon, the word is a measuring stick. They came up with rules. And they said, okay, if it was written by somebody who either witnessed Jesus's life, an eyewitness like Matthew or John, that counts. Or if they learned from somebody who was, think Luke, who learned from people who were Jesus's followers. They say that counts. Or Paul, for example. And so they come up with that and then they confirm it. Now, here's the last part. You're like, well, it's a very human process. I'm worried about it. Okay. I promise nothing substantial about your faith, what you believe and how you practice today. If second Peter isn't in the Bible, I promise nothing. What you believe about Jesus changes. If third John isn't in there, I would go as far as to say, you could take the book of Hebrews out of the new Testament and nothing shifts. You have less color in your picture. These books that we have in the New Testament provide a lot of color, a lot of shade, and it helps us. I mean, I'm glad that they're all in there, but it's not like we have a book in the Bible where you're like, well, if you remove this, holy smokes, everything you think and believe changes. It doesn't. It's coherent. It all flows together. And if one was missing, it doesn't change. So for me, that's a really big deal. I accept that there's a human process to canonization, but then I also kind of want to know the risk. I'm okay with humans doing it, but in my own mind, in my own faith, I want to say, well, what if they were wrong? Nothing changes for Stephen Feith or Madison Church in 2024. That's the bottom line.